afternoon, everyone. Massive welcome to KXC. If I've not met you before, my name's Pete. Together with my wife, B, we lead the church here. So if, if you're visiting, if you're new, massive, massive welcome to KXC. This is all in Sunday. It's an exciting moment for us. We do two of these moments each year where we pause whatever teaching series we're in. We cast vision. We tell stories of what God is doing. And we, we invite our four congregations into an all-in spirituality, giving all that we have to see God's kingdom break out here in King's Cross here in London. London and beyond. You'll notice these on your chairs. Ooh, how exciting. Um, my encouragement is to take this home. Don't read it during the talk. I know the temptation will be high. I am watching you. And we've got cameras just checking that you're not reading it during the talk. Um, take it home, read it through. This is a look back document of what God's been doing over the last year and then casting vision forward. I'm hoping it will be of huge encouragement to you. We're seeing God do some extraordinary things within our church family across the week on Sundays through our four congregations. Um, and as you read dear, this is my hope and prayer that you would be blown away and your response would be gratitude to God. This isn't a moment where we pat ourselves on the back. Aren't we good? Look at what we're doing. No, no, no. This is a moment to acknowledge this is a move of God we're experiencing. And yes, he moves through his sons and daughters, his hands and feet, but God is doing a sovereign work and he deserves all the glory. We don't want to snatch any glory from God, all glory to him. So we say, thank you, God, for what you're doing. But more than that, we dare to ask for more. Jesus said to those that have, more will be given. So we read the stories, we're like, Lord, thank you so much. And we long for more, more salvation, more stories of restoration and redemption and healing and breakthrough and freedom, more plants being sent out and the list goes on. Lord, thank you for what you're doing and we dare to ask for more. So do read that in your own time this week. I want to do three things in the message today. Number one, cast vision. Remind you if you've been here for some time of our vision statement. If you're new to KXC, this might be a first time, very exciting, to hear our vision statement. Two, to name our core convictions. What is it that we fundamentally believe as a church family in the core of our being? And three, to name our seven priorities for this moment in our story. So let's start with vision. What is our vision? Well, if you've got a Bible, you might want to turn to Revelation 21. This is the passage that creates the foundation for our vision statement. This is the penultimate chapter of the scriptures. So Revelation 21. And the Apostle John has a vision of the biblical story coming to completion. It's a beautiful, beautiful vision. Now Thomas Merton, a Catholic writer, said, Our lives are shaped by the end we live for. All of us, our lives are shaped by the end we live for. This is the end of our narrative. This is the story, is the family of God we seek to live in and to live out. And we want to be shaped by this glorious ending to the narrative. So the Apostle John has this vision, this heavenly vision of the end of the story. He writes this down. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. Listen to this. This is beautiful. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said to John, write this down for these words are trustworthy and they're true. Aren't we grateful that John wrote down this vision? Because here we have it, the end of the story. Not us ascending to some sort of disembodied bliss, but God coming down, making his dwelling place with humanity. And as God comes down, there's this scene of beautiful redemption and restoration. Suddenly there's no more 
or death or grief or crying or pain. You can almost feel the excitement as John is scribbling this down. It's like a restoration of Eden where there was no sin, no sickness, no suffering. Humanity fully alive in relationship with God. He's restoring everything to how it was in the beginning. And then you've got this picture of God sitting down which is indicative of his work coming to completion. And he declares these words, behold, I'm making all things new. Now let me nerd out on the language for one moment. In the Greek language, you've got two words for new. You've got neos and kainos. Let's say them together. Neos, kainos. So neos means brand new. Kainos is something old that's made new. It's restored to its former glory. And the word that the Apostle John chooses is kainos. Behold, I'm making all things kainos. I'm restoring everything to how it was meant to be in the beginning. That's the end of our story. It is beyond beautiful, and we want our lives to be shaped by the end that we're living for. So this is our vision statement, to serve God's purpose to make all things new. Serve God's purpose to make all things new. How do we go about this vision? And this is part B of our vision statement, to recklessly give ourselves away to God, each other, and the people of King's Cross and beyond. We want to be marked out by recklessness. Like another word would be passionately giving ourselves away. Now, I love language, so can I nerd out on another word? No, well, I'm going to anyway. So the word passion from the Latin verb passio, meaning to suffer. That's why we call Easter Passion Week. We see the sufferings of Jesus, the lengths he would go to suffering for our sake so that we might experience fullness of life. So when you say, I'm passionate about dot, 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 What you really mean by that is I so believe in the cause, I would willingly suffer for it. Now, we as a church, we so believe in the cause of the kingdom of God, God on a mission to make all things new, we would willingly suffer. Give the best of our time, our energy, our resources, our affection to seeing outbreaks of the kingdom of God here in King's Cross, here in London. We want to be marked out by passion, not half-heartedly giving ourselves away, apathetically giving ourselves away, or pathetically giving ourselves away. We want to recklessly give ourselves away to God, each other, the people of King's Cross and beyond. So what about our convictions? What do we believe in the core of our being? I want to name five of them. But before I name these convictions, I want to share a story of how a friend of mine, when he was 10 years old, got into train spotting. Now that isn't standard for 10 year olds to get into train spotting, but it happened to my friend. And this is how it happened. He was walking through Nottingham Town Centre and he saw this guy on a moped whiz past. He was with his friend. So this guy on the moped whizzes past and starts screaming, Kudos in the Vic! Kudos in the Vic! Kudos in the Vic! Now these two 10 year old boys are like, what the heck is happening? They knew the Vic was the Victoria train station. They had no idea about the kudu part of that statement. So they look at each other. What does that even mean? They're kind of like deeply, deeply intrigued. So they just start sprinting after the guy on the moped. They start sprinting to get to the train station. Now, eventually they get to the train station. They see this guy in the distance, park up his moped and start running into the train station. They follow him in. By the time they get to him, this guy's taken off his helmet, taken off his rucksack. He's pulled a book out of his bag. He's got a pen in his hand. He's ready to write something in the book. And they just grab him. You said... Kudu's in the Vic. You screamed, Kudu's in the Vic. What does that even mean? And this guy says, well, you see that train over there in the corner? Beautiful, majestic train. That's the Kudu train. It's never been in the Vic before. This is a historic moment. Kudu is in the Vic. And these two 10-year-olds are like, wow. Wow, kudos in the vet. What, what, what are you writing in the book? And he basically says, you see this book, it, it lists every single train that runs in this country. And every time a train comes into the Vic station, I just underline it. And today's a big day because Kuda is in the Vic. Wow. Where, where, where do we get the book? Where, where do we get the book? And he says, well, there's one shop in the town centre 
that sells these books. If you go there, you can get one for yourself. So they run to the shop. They buy themselves a book each. They sprint back. They open up the book. They stand in front of the kudu train. They underline it and they look at each other. Kudu's in the Vic. And that's the story of how they get into train spotting. Now, the reason they get into train spotting is because one individual was screaming with conviction, kudos in the Vic, and they start running to find out more. You see, we're living in a moment where genuinely worldviews are being shaken. Some of the dominant worldviews of our time are crumbling all around us. Anyone in this cultural moment living with raw conviction is gonna shine brightly. And we believe anyone living with these biblical convictions that I'm about to name, they're going to shine like stars in the universe. We want to operate as a church family with conviction. Here's our five convictions. Number one, surrendered to the scriptures. We as a family seek to be surrendered to the scriptures. I think you could make a good case for the most important seven words in scripture to be found in the Gethsemane narrative of Jesus getting ready for the cross. He's contemplating what is to come. He's sweating blood. He's unbelievably stressed. And he says, God, is there any other way? Could you take this cup of suffering from me? And then these seven words flow from his lips. Now, without these seven words, there would be no cross. Without these seven words, there would be no resurrection, there would be no ascension, there'd be no Pentecost, there'd be no birthing of the church, there would be no new creation. Everything hinges on these seven words. You ready for them? Not my will be done, but yours. This is Jesus basically saying, God, I surrender to your will. You know best, your will is best, I surrender to your will. Now the Apostle Paul, who writes a good chunk of the New Testament, he tries to articulate what it looks like to follow the way of Jesus, to live a cross-shaped life, the cruciform life. And the language he regularly uses to talk about this, he uses the language of submission which isn't a word that we use regularly in our culture today. It's a Greek word. Can I nerd out on another word? No? Well, I'm going to anyway. So here's the Greek word. It's hupotasso. So it's a compound word. Two words shoved together to form a new word. Hupo meaning underneath. Tasso meaning to order. So to submit is to order yourself beneath. So Paul regularly says, submit yourself to God. In other words, order yourself beneath. Rank yourself beneath. He also says in Ephesians, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, order yourself beneath. Prefer one another. So what is our response to Scripture? Our response to Scripture is to wrestle with the Scriptures to discern what do they say and what do they actually mean. And once we've done that work, because these Scriptures need interpretation, we elevate the Word of God that reveals the will of God. We rank ourselves beneath it and we say these words, not my will be done but yours. Whether we love what we read or can't stand what we read, we submit to the will of God. We don't stand over it, looking down upon it, projecting what we want it to say and then reading back what we genuinely want to hear. We don't inject ourselves into the scriptures. No, we order ourselves beneath. Lord, this feels a real struggle, but... I just trust that your vision for human flourishing is greater than anything I'm going to find on the face of the earth. So I say, not my will be done, but yours. And when you say that, do you know what it will feel like? It will feel like death. I just want to break it too gently. It's going to feel like death as you say no to your will. But it's going to release resurrection life. It will feel like death. It will release resurrection life. So as a church family, we're not trying to redefine the scriptures for our cultural moment. We wrestle with the text. We order ourselves beneath it. Not our will be done, but yours. Here's conviction number two. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want the Spirit to take us wherever the Spirit wants to take us. We, We basically want to give the Spirit free reign to do whatever He wants to do in our midst. 
right? He leads the church. Christ is the head of the church and the Spirit leads us forward and, and we want to surrender to whatever the Spirit wants to do. We're a charismatic church, which basically means we believe in all of the gifts of the Spirit. We believe they're all for today. We believe in the ministry of the Spirit. We're not embarrassed charismatics, trying to hide the fact that we believe all this stuff. We're not gentle charismatics. I've heard people talk about, like, I'm a charismatic with a seatbelt, whatever that means. We don't wear seatbelts when it comes to the charismatic. We're fully running wild in the things of the Spirit, right? We want the Spirit to do whatever the Spirit wants to do in our midst because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom. When we as leaders relinquish control and say, Spirit, do whatever you want to do, I can guarantee you more levels of freedom. Leaders that try and hold on to control, grieve the spirit, limit the freedom and limit the spirit and miss out on freedom. So this is the language we regularly use at KXC. We say we don't have a map, we have a guide. Now we've lifted this from the Exodus narrative where God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to lead the people from Egypt, from slavery into the promised land. But here's the deal. I'm not giving you a map for the journey because I know what you do with the map. You'd take the map, you'd have an argument about the directions, because that always happens when we do map reading, and then you'd keep your head down and you'd try and execute the plan, and it wouldn't develop intimacy or dependency. So I'm not going to give you a map. I'm going to give you a cloud by day and a fire by night. These are manifestations of my presence. Your one task is to stay close to the presence, and the presence will lead you to abundance. This is a head-up spirituality. Where's, where's the cloud moving? Where's the fire moving? We're going in that direction. This is what Jesus articulates in his ministry. He says, I only do what I see my Father doing. Not head down, execute the plan, head up. Father, where are you moving today? Because I'm going to jump on board. Paul talks about keeping in step with the Spirit. That isn't head down, execute the strategy, head up. Spirit, where are you moving? You have my yes. Because when we track with the presence of God, the presence will lead us towards abundance. We want a heads up spirituality, which means our strategies don't come from boardrooms, they come from prayer rooms where we host the presence of God, hear his voice and step into obedience. And it means from time to time, God will tell us to do something totally foolish that makes us look like idiots. Do we care? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because I've read the scriptures. I know that God takes the foolish things sometimes to shame the wise and the weak things to shame the strong. So when God speaks, we say yes and we chase after his presence. Conviction number three, following the way of Jesus. We want to become like Jesus from one degree of glory to another. Now, here's how life in London works. If you've lived in London for any length of time, you'll know this. The culture creates currents. And when you jump into the culture, the currents move you. If you've recently moved to London and you've just jumped into the river of London life, you'll know that these currents are already moving you. And they're moving you towards becoming a certain type of person, towards these cultural norms, things that become normal for all of us. So let me give you some example of cultural norms. If you spend any length of time in London, you'll become a certain type of person, certain type of Londoner. You'll start moving more quickly, living a more hurried life. Like your journey to the station, it's no longer this. Hey guys, that's things. It's head down, get out of my way. I'm on a mission. When I go for a walk with my family, I'm in the Cotswolds, which is where my mum and dad are based. They regularly say, Pete, chill the heck out. We're going for a walk in fields. We're not rushing for a train. Calm down, chill the heck out, right? Let's just enjoy nature, enjoy one another. Because I've been shaped by London life where you move at pace. These cultural currents in London will move you towards narcissism because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog culture and we learn, we're trained to see one another as rivals. This dominates in the workplace. The people around you, they are your competition fighting for promotion. But even before you get to work, just getting on the train, you spot all these rivals, don't you dare go for that seat. I had my eyes on that seat long before you set eyes on that seat. That is 
mine, right? And you learn to think and operate like that. These currents move you towards idolizing performance and productivity, where you begin to value others and yourself according to how productive you've been, how well you're performing. You become a certain type of person by just jumping in the river of the culture and the currents beginning to move you. And we as the church wanna say no, and we want a vision of counterformation. Yes, we want to be in the culture, but not of the culture. We want to be jumping in the river of the kingdom of God, the life of the spirit, because there are different currents that begin to form us into the likeness of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. So at KXC, we have a high vision on intentional discipleship, intentional formation. This is the language we sometimes use, that the life of Jesus is found in the lifestyle of Jesus. Or John Mark Comer put it like this, if you want the life of the kingdom, you need to adopt the lifestyle of the kingdom. Certain practices that form you into the likeness of Jesus. This is a core conviction for us. Number four, conviction, living as family. I want you just to scan the room. Look around the room. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I know you know that, that God is our father. We're his sons and daughters, which makes us brothers and sisters. I know most of us believe that, but we don't operate like that. If you genuinely began to operate, that everyone in this room was your brother and sister in Christ, it would transform the life of our community. Like Sunday gatherings wouldn't just be, oh, I rock up if it's convenient, if I've not got anything else to do. Sunday gatherings would be like family reunions. Like you don't miss precious family reunions. A serving culture would begin to develop where we come ready to serve because that's what you do in family. We're not just co-workers in Christ. We are that. We're more than that. We're brothers and sisters. And in a family, you serve. Think about a dating culture. And I know a number of you think regularly about the dating culture here at KXC. It would transform... The dating culture, because as, as you look around the room, you're not just spotting romantic interests, potential dates. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's just add to the intensity, because I love doing that. <laughs> as you look across the room, these potential partners, they belong to Jesus. Yeah. They are of infinite worth to Jesus. So don't treat carelessly that which is of infinite worth to Jesus. Be really careful with the possessions of God Almighty. We want to learn to honour one another as brothers and sisters. Now, what unites us as family? And the answer is the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. But it's a work of the Spirit amongst us as a people to develop unity. Listen to these words. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This is the Apostle John having another one of his visions of heaven. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, a massive family, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This massive family united around the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if you want radical diversity, and we want that here at KXC, if you want radical diversity, it needs to be held together with a radical unity. This is the challenge of a secular vision of multiculturalism. They want radical diversity, but there's no unity holding it all together. Diversity without unity creates division, and we see that everywhere in our city. We want radical diversity. You get there by radical unity. Now, we're grateful at KXC over the last number of years. We've had an amazing team called the 7-9 team from this passage in Revelation 7-9. They've taken that as their core verse. They've been praying for, contending for, working towards bringing leadership to this vision of seeing KXC step into a greater measure of racial and ethnic diversity. And we've seen God do a remarkable work and that team is going through a number of shifts so Tim May and Jess Bradley are going to be bringing fresh leadership to that team because we've seen God do an amazing work yet we're longing for more longing for more yes more racial diversity but more than that a greater expression of cultural diversity 
like fresh ways of being, doing church, fresh sounds, raising up leaders across the spectrum. We're longing for more diversity. And beyond just racial diversity and ethnic diversity, we're longing for a greater measure of socioeconomic diversity. We're longing for a greater measure of demographic diversity. We want to reflect this vision of heaven. Every tribe, tongue gathered around the throne. Conviction number five, extending the kingdom in the world through the local church. The spirit sent from God meets the church on its way to the world, right? So the spirit comes from the Father and meets the church on its way to the world. If you want to track with the Spirit, you've got to follow the Spirit into the world. Okay, so we're called to be a missionary people. Here's the three elements of our mission at KXE. Number one, we want to be compassionate with our engagement in the local community. Now, compassion means to feel the heart of God. It's like gut feeling for the things that move the heart of God. We believe if there is a bias in the heart of God, and I believe there is, by the way, if there is a bias in the heart of God, it's a bias towards the poor. It's a bias towards the broken. It's a bias towards the vulnerable. The first move Jesus makes in mission, in terms of incarnation, cross, resurrection, the first move is the incarnation. God taking on flesh in the person of Jesus to enter the pain and the suffering. If it's the first move God makes in mission is towards the pain, the first move of any local church should be towards the hurting, towards the vulnerable, towards those that are historically pushed to the margins of culture. And we want to be a church that brings those from the margins right into the center of who we are, which is why as a church family, we want to give the best of our energy and our resources and our time to serving those on the margins, to breaking the cycles of poverty that rob people of life standing with those experiencing injustice and seeing kingdom breakthrough. That's the first part of our mission. Secondly, we want to be courageous in sharing our faith. I said this earlier, but I really believe this. Culture is there for the taking right now. Like worldviews are quite literally crumbling on our watch. Our younger generation are basically tearing up the secular scripts and saying, this ain't working for me anymore. I was told, according to secularism, that if I look inwards, I can be my own savior, my own rescuer, but it isn't working. I don't have what it takes. Like it promised me the good life. I'm not experiencing the good life. Higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of despair. I need a savior. There is a humility stirring within the younger generation crying out for savior. We have a message to tell. Good news about a savior who lived, who died, who rose again, and can bring us everlasting life. Here's the question, genuinely, will we rise up in this moment and proclaim our faith? When there's a generation yearning to hear of a better story, will we rise up in a moment like this, live with boldness and courage, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? Thirdly, third element of our mission is to be creative in our pursuit of cultural renewal. We believe this is what our story is about, God on a mission to make all things new. That means our story has everything to say about the renewal of the music industry and the fashion industry and the renewal of politics and the renewal of banking and the renewal of education and the renewal of the NHS and the list goes on. We are sent out as missionaries carrying the presence of God to be agents of renewal in every sphere of culture. And we want to take that pursuit seriously. So here's our five convictions. And my encouragement to you is to live like that nutter on the moped, riding through Nottingham. Kudos in the Vic! Like in this cultural moment where the culture's there for the taking, if we rose up and lived with conviction, we would shine brightly in the context of London. I want my life to be like a declaration that if you want everlasting life, here's how you find it. Surrender to the scriptures, led by the spirit, following the way of Jesus, living as family, extending his kingdom in the world. I want you to know these convictions go so deep in me. I couldn't belong to a church that didn't value these core convictions. I would give my life for these convictions. We want to be a people driven by these core convictions. Thirdly then, 
our priorities. We've named seven priorities, the number of perfection. So these seven priorities are an outworking of these convictions. And we believe these seven priorities are really for the next maybe five years, 10 years, and three of them we're gonna particularly zoom in on. But let me name the seven priorities. Firstly, prioritizing the presence. Our primary calling is to host the presence of God. That means our primary task is that of prayer. We don't want just to lean towards activism because we believe what Jesus said in John 15, he basically said, remain in the vine and if you'll remain in the vine, you'll bear much fruit. Jesus doesn't lie. In other words, the path to fruitfulness is abiding. It's hosting the presence. So our highest priority as a church is to gather together and host the presence of Jesus, believing that presence will lead us to abundance. Secondly, multiplying mature disciples. We've realized in this last season where we've experienced accelerated growth, we have so many people that are new Christians or exploring the person of Jesus, exploring Christianity, and they're asking simple questions such as, no one raised me when it comes to following the way of Jesus, how to read scripture, how to pray. Could someone teach me the basics? Don't presume I know, because I don't. Can someone just teach me, how do I follow the way of Jesus? So we want to take that seriously and create discipleship pathways that help train people how to follow the way of Jesus. But more than that, we've heard a number of people articulate, and I feel this myself, Basically, a yearning saying, I'm dissatisfied with my own level of maturity, even though I've been following Jesus for many, many years, if not decades. I've been following for decades, but there's certain things I'm still doing. I, I feel like I long to grow in maturity. Could someone share how I can do that? And we want to take that request seriously. Here's the reality. Time doesn't guarantee maturity, right? You know that. In the same way that time doesn't guarantee healing. You know, people say time's a healer. It's a lie. It's nonsense. Time doesn't heal. Jesus heals. Amen. He heals over time. But I've met many old people who are angry and bitter. Time clearly wasn't a healer for them. So Jesus heals and he does it over time. Time doesn't guarantee maturity. I've met many people, Christians for decades, who are unbelievably, spectacularly immature in their faith. Right? So Jesus brings maturity. The Spirit transforms us into the likeness of Jesus from one degree of glory to the next. That Im involves us participating in the work of the Spirit. So we want to take seriously, how as a church can we go on a journey towards maturity? Whether you've been following Jesus for a week or 40 years, how can we grow in maturity? Thirdly, raising healthy leaders. There's abundance everywhere like 40 people that can't fit in this space. And that's true at the 11.30 service, the 5 p.m. service is growing. There's so much life. How do we steward it? And the answer is we need pillars to help us carry the weight of what the Lord is doing in our church family. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, you're a rock and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I need rock-like foundations to get this building going. And when he teaches the disciples how to follow after him, he basically tells them a story. And the, the meaning of the story is don't build your life on sand where the foundations are weak. Build your life on rock-like foundations. We believe God is building something beautiful here at KXC, but we're going to need pillars to rise up and help us carry the weight of what God is asking us to carry. So we're going to have to do some leadership development type work. We want to raise up healthy leaders. Number four, investing in the next generation. The, the children of KXC, the teenagers of KXC, they're not just the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. Today, this is kind of a God provision moment. We've been given almost half a million pounds of funding to spend over the next five years in developing a youth minister at KXC. Credible provision. Now, by youth minister, we mean a center of youth ministry where we can train people up to reach teenagers across the borough. So reaching teenagers, discipling the teenagers we've already got, raising up youth workers, not just for KXC, but for other churches in the borough. It's an incredibly exciting moment. We need to prioritize all of us praying for what God is doing amongst the kids of KXC and the teenagers of KXC. And if you've got a passion for kids, teenagers, you should get involved and start serving. Number five, creating room at the table. 
we are literally unable to fit in our building. Last Sunday, we had well over 900 people across the four services. This building fits 200 capacity upstairs. You could do the math. We basically don't fit in. We're, we're like unable to fit in. We need to start praying for miracle provision. King's House, where we're meeting now, was a miracle provision two years ago. What a gift it's been, but we need to pray for breakthrough, for miracle provision so we could steward the abundance that God is stirring within our family. I'll say more about that in a moment. Number six, sharing Jesus courageously, living boldly, living bravely, proclaiming our faith. Number seven, planting faith filled churches. Three weeks ago, we planted this church in Stockwell, South London. For the launch service, 190 people rocked up, right? Today, they'll be meeting. They'll be meeting right now as we speak. This will be their third Sunday after launch. God is stirring beautiful, beautiful things. We're trying all the plants that have been sent out from KXC. We're trying to operate as a family. The family's called Table. There are 13 churches in the family. Um, We've adopted a group of churches in Nottingham, but the other churches have been planted out or planted out of churches that have been planted out, if you get my drift. Um, 13 churches part of the family. But we've got a vision to plant multiple churches across the country, as well as churches across the city. So here's our seven priorities, of which three we're specifically going after in the next year. Multiplying mature disciples. Secondly, investing in the next generation. Thirdly, sharing Jesus courageously. What is our response? Our response is to be all in. This is the spirituality that you find on the pages of the New Testament, the story of the early church. They weren't half-hearted in their devotion. As I said, they weren't apathetically following the way of Jesus or pathetically following the way of Jesus. They were recklessly following the way of Jesus, giving themselves for the kingdom cause. And we want to invite our church into an all-in mindset. And there's four practices we want to invite our church family into. Come, belong, serve, give. Come, belong, like beyond the Sunday, join a small group. We call them hubs where we live in and live out the story of God together. Find a place to serve and give financially. Now, we've been growing a lot in this last year. And I think that there are three dominant groups in our church as we gather Sunday by Sunday across the four congregations. Number one, there's family. Those in the room that you would say KXC is your spiritual home. In other words, hopefully you come regularly. Hopefully you belong to a hub. And there's 600 or so people in our hub communities. Um, Hopefully you found a place to serve because that's how family operates. And hopefully you give financially. So there there are those that would say, KXC is my church. This is my family. Secondly, there are visitors. Now, if you're visiting KXC today, we want you to know you are unbelievably welcome. We know some people are visiting because they're exploring faith, exploring the person of Jesus. We know others um, that are mature Christians that are visiting us because they've heard some of the story of what God is doing here. And like a pilgrim on a journey, they're hungry for an encounter with Jesus. And our prayer for you is that as you visit us to drink from the well of what the Spirit is stirring in this place, you would have some radical encounters with God by the Spirit. We pray that for you so that you can experience Experience something of the kingdom that you can take back to your local church. So there are family amongst us. There are visitors, but I also want to name there's a third group. Um, I'm calling them consumers. Now, these are different to visitors because the consumers come fairly regularly, not just like once every so often. They come fairly regularly, but they wouldn't say KXC is their local church. So they come fairly regularly, but they don't belong to a small group. They don't serve the family and they don't give financially. And I think I've come to this realization that in my own leadership as a kind of spiritual father in this house, and I think our key leadership team feel the same, we've enabled something to develop 
that enables people to come and consume at KXC and stay in a state of infancy. And I feel like as a pastor here, I need to repent and say sorry to everyone because enabling people, facilitating people, just going through the motions in a way that holds them in a state of infancy when God's desire for you is to move you towards maturity. We don't want to facilitate that holding pattern in infancy. So this is my encouragement. If you're not in the family category, you're not just like a one-off visitor, you're coming regularly but you don't serve, you don't give, you're just consuming. Here's my encouragement. Either stay and put down roots and become part of the family because you'll come alive as you do that, as you come belong, serve, give. Either stay, put down roots, call this place your family or go to one of the two or three other churches that you sporadically pop in on and call that place home and put down roots there. Come, belong, serve there. Give here financially, but come, belong, serve. (laughs) Uh, That's obviously a joke. Um, For those that don't stay, go and commit yourself to your local family. Come, belong, serve, give there. But my deep encouragement for your own well-being, Please don't stay in this pattern of infancy where you just consume visiting three or four churches on a sort of like rotation basis, but not committed to any of them because you will not grow in your faith. So here's some stats for those that love some stats. Um, These are stats looking back on the last year. So 1,200 people would call KXC home. Now, as of the autumn, another season of growth, we're probably way beyond that figure already. But 1,200 people would call KXC home. 573 people are in our hub communities. That's 48%. But then look at the serving culture. 538 people volunteer in some capacity. That's amazing. If you serve at KXC, massive thank you for serving. Like the ministries that are flowing out of this church, beautiful kingdom things are happening and they're happening because of your willingness to serve. So I want to say thank you. But just imagine if that 45% was 100%. I as a leader, I choose to lead with high levels of naivety that one day, KXC, 100% of people will be serving. I choose to live in that place of naivety, embracing the disappointment and the knocks that come my way, because I want to be in a church family where we recognize being family means we serve together. If you've grown up in church, you'll know this to be true. The way a lot of churches function is that a um, a low number of highly committed volunteers do a huge amount of work to carry the weight for a lot of people who don't want to invest. And after time, they just burn out because they're carrying so much weight. And then the church try and replace them, find some other volunteers who are really keen, burn them out. Next wave, next wave. We don't want to operate like that. It doesn't need to be like that. But the only way to operate differently is to have a mindset of we are all going to plug in. We are all going to serve. Once a month, come on a Sunday, ready to serve. The local mission ministries that operate throughout the week, once a month, find one where you can serve. Let's talk about financial giving. So currently, 414 people give. That's 34% of the church. The average gift, and you can see this in your booklets, is £234 per month. So the average giver of those that give is almost £3,000 per year. That is incredible generosity. If you give regularly at KXC, I want to say a massive thank you for your generosity. We're not funded by the Church of England or some big donors in America. We are purely funded by the generosity of the people in the pews. For those that give, I want to say a massive, massive thank you. But just imagine if that 34% was 100%. I've got this pipe dream that one day B and I will belong to a church where 100% of the people are giving. Now, that might be when we plant a church and we're the only ones in it. But I have, <laughs> I choose to live with that level of naivety. I just, I want to be in a church where everyone's all in, right? Because that's what family's like. Everyone chips in. Now, for those that like pie charts, anyone like pie charts? Okay, there's a handful of people who like their pie charts. So this is how the income comes in. Total income is 1.802 million over the course of the year. Expenditure, and you can read this in your own time in the booklet, total expenditure is 1.867 million. You'll notice that we're spending more than is coming in. 
And that's because of the accelerated growth that we've been experiencing and we're struggling to keep up. Here's another graph. The green dotted line is adult attendance. The kids' attendance is the gold line at the bottom. So what you'll see is from September 2022 to August of 24, we've grown from 600 to roughly 800. Now, since the autumn's kicked in, we're more like 900 attendants on a Sunday. But you'll see the giving line in dark blue. Two years ago, we had just under 400. Now we just have over 400. But let's just pause there. Two years ago, we were a church of 600 with 400 giving. Now we're a church of over 900 with roughly 400 giving. In other words, there's been an explosive growth, but we haven't drawn people into the discipleship journey of come, belong, serve, give. And the only way for us to steward what God is doing in this moment is to invite the whole church into the life of the family, come, belong, serve, give. So we've got two goals financial goals for this Vision Sunday, All In Sunday. Number one is we want to up our regular giving by 100,000 over the course of the year. Up our regular giving by 100,000. Now, we think that's a low bar, okay? So of 900 that come Sunday by Sunday, um, we've got 400 or so giving right now. 36 givers giving the average gift of two, three, four per month would hit that figure of 100,000. So we think that's a low bar. We quite like setting low bars because when you cross them, you feel amazing about yourself and it's really encouraging. We think we could probably double that. But let's at least nail 100,000. 34% of the church currently giving. If we push that dial towards 40% regularly giving, we want 100%, I want 100%, but even a movement towards 40% would increase our regular giving by 185,000 pounds, okay? So regular giving, we want to increase that. Secondly, goal two is we want to develop 150,000 pounds in one-off gifts. Now, there are two building projects that we're in early conversations about. One is a Sunday venue. We can't fit in King's House. I love King's House, but we can't fit in King's House. There's a possibility of a, a door opening for us to explore another option for Sundays in the area. Now, it's very, very early stages of the conversations, so I can't mention more. But if that door were to swing open, we would need to move swiftly and we would need to move by faith. There's a second building project, a residential um, building, a number of flats. Together, we've entered a conversation about purchasing the site that would enable us to accommodate some curates and church planters and some of our staff team that want to live locally in their mission field, but with the salaries we pay them, it's financially a real struggle. Whereas if we can purchase this site, we can provide affordable housing for some of our key workers, and hopefully there would be space to create a kind of monastic center with community living and a rhythm of prayer. Really exciting opportunity. But if that door opens, we're gonna to need to move fast and by faith and a wave of generosity. So we wanna build a pot of a roughly 150K. We're probably gonna need a lot more than that, but let's go after 150K because if a door opens, it's gonna provide the resources for us to get architectural plans, planning permission, all of this stuff, just to even explore the opportunity. Either way, we want to invite our church into a moment of sacrificial, generous giving. To increase our regular giving, if you don't give in a regular way, maybe now's the time to step into the practice, the spiritual practice, the biblical practice of regular giving. If you already give in a regular way, perhaps this is a moment to review your giving. But equally, this might be a moment for people to give above and beyond their regular gift as like an offering beyond the tithe, if you've grown up with this language of tithe and offerings, towards this one-off amount that can help us get ready to move by faith if a door opens. So how can you give? I can hear people desperate to know. Let me add them. I want to give. I want to give. How can you give? Calm down. We'll get to that. Um, for those that want to give, there's three ways you can give. Number one, you can head to the website, kxe.org.uk forward slash give. Number two, you can use the QR codes. If you grab your phone, you can basically use the QR code. It will take you to that website, kxc.org.uk forward slash give. Or you can take this piece of paper and you simply fill in your name, your address. You can put in a one-off donation or a regular amount per month. And then ticking these gift aid boxes enables us to claim 25% back, which is a game changer. Now, we want to invite people into this moment. As I said, if you read through this during the week, you'll realize 
God is doing remarkable things in this moment in our story. We are so grateful. We dare to ask him for more, increase what you're doing. But if we're going to say, Lord, we love what you're doing, increase what you're doing, we're also going to have to rise up and learn to steward what he's blessing us with. And therefore, we need to invite people towards regular giving. We're going to have a moment just to pray, just to have a little moment with the Lord to ask him, Lord, would you direct my steps as it relates to what my response is to the vision of Kirksey. What would it look like for you to take a step further towards an all-in spirituality? Come, belong, serve, give. What, what would the next step on that journey look like? And we don't want anyone to be driven by pressure, by guilt, by anxiety, by condemnation. The New Testament talks about cheerful giving. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. In other words, when we're overwhelmed by what God is doing, it's our joy and privilege to invest in what he's building. And therefore, we, we give from this place of overflow of gratitude and joy. So we don't want anyone giving from a place of anxiety or pressure. If you're feeling any of that right now, this would be my encouragement. Do nothing right now, but take the forms home and have a, a pray on your own with your husband or wife or just you and the Lord and ask him, in that place, Lord, how would you have me respond to what you're stirring in my church family in KXC? So if you need to do this in your own time, feel free to, but there will be some in the room that you might be ready to make a response now. And the reality is most people, when they respond in the moment, it moves them towards action. Most of us operate, if we take it home, we think we'll get round to it. Motives are pure, but often we just don't get round to it. So if you feel like you're in a place where you're ready to make a response, we want to create that space. So Holy Spirit, fill this room. <coughs> Direct our steps. We don't want anything to feel like a manipulation. We don't want there to be any pressure. We know that a lot of us get anxious when we talk about money. So Lord, we pray for peace to fill this place that we would learn as your sons and daughters to trust you with our resources, to trust that you'll provide each day the daily bread that we need. Lord, as we jump into the river of your kingdom, Lord, would, would, would these currents of your spirit move us towards becoming more generous like you are, becoming more faith-filled? Holy Spirit, come.